everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Photographers join us from all over the country to connect, inspire, <coughs> and create. We're here live on Zoom every Wednesday night with a new topic and a guest speaker that shares their photography experiences with us. To see the list of upcoming presentations, please visit my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find our previous sessions linked to my YouTube channel. So please subscribe, like, and share with other photographers that would enjoy our content and better yet, invite them to join us live. My guest tonight is Chris Crass. A landscape and travel photographer based in Miami. Chris is a full-time professional photographer that specializes in lifestyle, branding, and video projection. You can find him on Instagram at Boss Talk Pro or on his website at bosstalkpro.com. In tonight's session, approaching 35 millimeter film photography as a digital photographer. Chris will talk about why digital photographers should try shooting on film and his special techniques for combining digital and film. So Chris was here about a year ago to talk about drone photography, and you can find that session on the YouTube channel under session number 32. Chris, welcome back to the Happiness Hour. Hi, right, glad to be here. Yay. Thank you for coming back. Um, I know that, well, I follow, I've follow you on Instagram and you put out a lot of content. So I know that you are staying busy. Um, mm -hmm. Are you working on any cool projects you want to share with, with the peanut gang tonight? Um, so in general, I am a landscape photographer and I am taking the show on the road, so to speak, uh, okay. building out a van going to be hitting the road some sometime end of the year and hopefully going to be visiting all these amazing spots that we have in the U S because I do a lot of traveling but overseas, and I really haven't explored, I mean, a few spots obviously here in the US, but there's just so much to see here that, you know, I'm just gonna build the van out and just kind of like full-time content create. So that's my, my main plan um, upcoming. And uh, as far as projects specifically, it's probably gonna be related to that. You know, I'm gonna have the vlogs and all that going on, but uh, yeah, excited to be doing that. Yeah, well, uh, one of the things that I have enjoyed since I follow you on Instagram, is that you're really good at filling your, my story. And um, I'm hoping, crossing my fingers, that you'll continue that on the road, just because it is yep. kind of fun to watch people as they're, you know, exploring places and, and um, doing things that I'm not doing, because I'm sitting there watching you do it. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for you that you'll be able to get out there really, really soon. Oh, I also want to mention that I'm, I'm putting together a landscape photography course. Oh, okay. Um, so if anybody's interested, you know, drop your email. Um, it's probably going to be completed in the next maybe two to three months, probably around the same time as I hit the road, because it's going to be part of how I'm funding my whole journey. Okay. But um, yeah, putting this whole course together, I'm probably going to start with landscape photography and then expand to my many, many photography hobbies uh, afterwards. All right. We'll look forward to seeing that. And actually, if you don't mind, when you get that up and running, let me know and I'll share that with um, the, the, the channel here. So Awesome. Thank you. All right. You bet. All right. With that, let's let you get started. So film photography. Approaching film photography as a digital photographer. I apologize to any film photography purists or people who actually shot on film back in the day. Um, because my, my ideas and the way I approach things are just as a digital photographer, as it says in the title, and um, just kind of like using it as a creative, creative medium um, rather than, you know, the traditional way, so to speak. So let me go next here. So why, why 35 millimeter? So I'm going to be talking specifically about 35 millimeter film. Obviously, there's many types of film, but it's the most uh, accessible, I would say. So why, why shoot on film? We have these great digital cameras. You know, you take a photo, you look at it, you change some settings, you take a great photo and, and you have everything there. You don't, you're not limited by your number of photos. Why would we even wanna shoot on film? Well, so part of it is it's kind of hipster, right? So the people who are into film photography, they tend to be sort of like these retro hipster kind of types. And not to say that I am one of those, but that's the majority of what I would say the film 
shooters are these days. Uh, there's also the aspect of delayed gratification, because like I said, you know, you can grab your phone, you see something cool, you take a photo, you have the photo there, and it's just, it's almost too easy. So there is this idea of making things more difficult as a challenge. Um, you know, it's human nature to seek out challenges. So film photography is definitely a challenge, right? There's also the unique look, uh, different types of film, different types of cameras, lenses and stuff. It doesn't look exactly like digital, you know, it's a little bit softer. Uh, the colors, you know, every film has a color profile. So kind of, you know, ISOs and it just looks different than digital, you know, so it's kind of the point there. Uh, creative opportunities, you know, just, you know, my approach to combining the digital and the film together, um, sort of a creative uh, outlet. And then lastly, the gear is cheaper. So while it is more expensive per image, if you think about it, you know, roll, the roll of film developing on all that, um, the gear itself is cheaper. You hear, you hear stories of people finding, you know, at Goodwill, at garage sales, they find gear, uh, you know, you know, decent cameras, sometimes even Leicas and those crazy ones, but, you know, a dollar, a couple bucks, you know, so you can find this gear for, for cheap, or if you go on eBay, you might have luck there, though some of the stuff on eBay has already been researched, so people will bump up the prices because they sort of know that it's in high demand, and a lot of the YouTubers out there will kind of hype up certain camera brands and cameras, uh, camera models, and it'll be more expensive than it should be, you know, especially with some of the point shoots out there, it's kind of ridiculous. So the gear is cheaper, and then I put theft risk here because I actually like doing street photography with these cameras because I can walk into uh, sort of dangerous areas, areas that I wouldn't walk around with a two to $3,000 camera plus lenses and all that uh, with my digital gear, but I can have like, you know, a $100 camera, film camera and, and get some cool photos. And then if I get mugged, you know, nobody really wants to get mugged, but worst case scenario, you know, they take a cheap little camera from me. So it's, it's also uh, an interesting aspect of shooting on film. So what is 35 millimeters? So there are, are numerous types of cameras that shoot 35 millimeter there. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, but there's your typical SLRs, you know, which is the non digital DSLR, the SLR is single, re single lens reflex, which basically means you look through the viewfinder and what you're seeing is what the lens is seeing and what the photo is going to be. Um, so you can take an accurate composition of a scene. There's also the point shoots, which are great for getting started. I personally am not a fan because it's, it kind of takes away the whole point of shooting on film where you can change lenses and get creative. You know, it's, it's good if you just want to like try it out or get started for cheap. Um, just don't buy one of these hyped up point shoots like the Olympus, uh, what is this Olympus stylus two or all these crazy ones that are just way overpriced. TLR is twin lens reflex where you have two lenses and use one to look through and focus and one that actually takes the image. So you have to compensate for that difference because what one lens is seeing is not what the actual photo is going to be. And then, of course, medium format, range, far, range finders, large format, you know, what Ansel Adams shot on and all this stuff that I'm really not going to get into. But there are people who are really into that stuff, wet plates and all this. So it's, it's really as challenging as you want to get. That's kind of the good thing with uh, shooting on film in general. Now, types of film, there's obviously color and black and white. But then within those, there's different types of film, different brands, and they look different the way they render certain colors, the blues, the reds. It's just... Um, it's hard to describe. You have to look at exact examples, which I'm not going to go through examples of every type of film. But if you look through them, you'll see just the way they, they render colors are different. And then on top of that, um, for color and black and white, there's a range of ISOs. So the main thing with shooting on film is that it's not like with your digital camera where you can just change the ISO and then bring up your shutter speed and then you have sports photography. It's like you have to choose the film for the scene or for the situation that you're going to be shooting in. So if you shoot with something that's 800 ISO, well, you can shoot faster shutter speeds. I use a lot of 800, 800 ISO film for night photography um, because obviously higher ISO means you can shoot, um, you know, sh shorter shutter speeds and then, um, or faster shutter speeds rather. And then uh, same thing with uh, black and white, you know, there's, there's ISO, one of the films that I like that's ISO 3200, which is pretty insane. It's very grainy, um, but some people, you know, go for the grainy look on purpose. So, um, and there's obviously like Lightroom presets and filters that will add this to digital, but it's just not the same as shooting actually on film. It's like, I think there's a Quentin Tarantino quote where he says, you know, all these people are trying to, Im and it applies to film, like, you know, movies, but you know, all these people are trying to shoot film with digital cameras or video cameras if you want that look, just shoot on film, you know? And so basically the same point I'm trying to make here. And then I mentioned here, pushing and pulling versus box speed. Um, I actually only shoot a box speed, which means whatever the film is rated, I shoot at that. Um, 
there is a technique that I haven't really gotten into because it's a little complicated because you have to deal with the developing side of things, but you can push certain films more. Basically, um, you can shoot it as if it was a higher ISO. So there's a way of doing that with the camera, which is a little technical, but you can push certain films. Uh, Portra 400 is a very popular film. The Portra series in general is pretty popular. I like the uh, 800 myself for night photography, but uh, the Portra films are very good with pushing and pulling. And um, you can basically, like I said, you can make it seem as if it was a higher ISO film and that's something that's about film that's it's more forgiving, uh, especially with the highlights, like blowing out highlights and stuff like that. So what type of photography looks best in film? So um, I personally like street photography. And ironically, I don't shoot street photography with uh, digital cameras. I mean, I have obviously dabbled in it, but it's just not something I do kind of by default because it almost seems too easy. You know, you, you, you have to like obviously find these compositions and these scenes. And, you know, if you're one of those people who kind of like pops up a photo and then you know like tries to not make it obvious so people see you taking photos um you can do that method but overall it's easier to do it digitally with street photography on film you uh you have the challenge of, of, ex of exposing how to expose which i'll cover a little bit later but overall what makes street photography easy in film is that you're not dealing with high dynamic range scenes um you know you're not like that also depends where you're shooting you know obviously if there's really dark areas and bright areas next to each other that won't be the case but Street photography is pretty easy to get everything in one frame. Um, so that works well for film photography. Uh, portraits and fashion are also popular. Um, street, street portraits and stuff like that. I personally, like I said, I don't shoot. Um, I don't know if I mentioned actually, I don't, I don't shoot a lot of people, you know, with, with cameras, but um, I, uh, I like street photography scenes and sometimes I'll have people in it, but usually I like a single person and it'll be very just kind of like random, you know, catch them in the moment kind of thing rather than actual portraits. It's just not uh, my type of thing that I like shooting, but it is very popular with film. Uh, what doesn't work well? So I, as I mentioned, I'm a primarily a landscape photographer, but what doesn't work well is shooting landscapes on film because you're, especially with the wide vistas, you're dealing with high dynamic, dynamic range scenes, you know, really bright skies. And maybe if it's a dark valley or shadows in the mountains or whatever it is, you can shoot film, landscape photography on film, obviously. But usually what works better is like close, close up shots, little details, but you're not going to be bracketing images and editing um, in Photoshop, which technically you can do, but it's a lot more work and I would probably avoid it. Um, so that's yeah and then actually we just had a discussion about underwater photography which i didn't even consider on film but it seems very difficult and not something that i would want to undertake either so what are some film photography techniques well if you're shooting during the day you can shoot handheld you know depending on the iso rating of your film you know some of the iso 100 stuff you have to be careful with camera shake but you can shoot a lot of street photography during the day handheld for sure at night i would strongly recommend using a tripod because you're gonna be doing more long exposure type things. It's a little bit more cumbersome to be walking around with a tripod. But um, if you're walking around in dangerous areas, I guess you can use it as a weapon, you know, self-defense. Um, but yeah, just for taking the photos, a tripod helps at night. Um, and then I put Studio Fashion Flash here. If you're doing the portraits kind of, you know, uh, portrait kind of stuff, you know, obviously you would use a either a studio setting with flashes or however do they do that. I don't as I mentioned, I don't do that uh, type of photography. So how do you expose? This is the biggest hurdle apart from getting the gear and then, you know, how to use it. But how do you expose for film? Well, most cameras, um, depending on how old of a camera you get, uh, they'll have a built-in meter. Some, some of them have a digital meter. Some have a, I don't know if it's called an analog meter, but it's a little stick where you point it at a scene. And if it's going too high up, you're overexposed. And if it goes too low, you're underexposed. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's your meter right there. You can also use um a or numerous apps they have for phones to to meter a scene which uses a reflective type uh of metering where it has to be sort of close to what you're shooting um you can't like meter for a distant mountain um for that you can use special metering devices called spot meters uh, i don't have any of these so i'm just speaking from what i hear i use either uh my cameras with the built-in meter or the iphone app for one of my cameras which actually the built-in meter is broken so um, then there's also the what they call the sunny 16 rule, which I don't I'm not a big fan of, but basically you shoot at F16 during bright scenes, keep your shutter speed. I believe the shutter speed has to match your ISO and you adjust the aperture based on the brightness of the scene. Um, so, you know, if it's a little bit cloudy, you go down to F10, F4, whatever it is. 
The reason why I don't like this uh, style of metering is because I like to be in control of the aperture and if I want something with bokeh and, you know, so, uh, the foreground in focus and the background out of focus, you know, obviously it doesn't apply to this rule. So I do not use the Sunny 16 rule, but it is an option. Uh, now developing. So when most people think of film photography, especially if you were into it in the uh, good old days or uh, battle days, if you're a big fan of digital, um, you think of you, you shoot your film and you go into a dark room with the with the red light and then you develop it and then you have I don't even know how it really works but you have it magnified onto special printing sheets I believe uh, you dip it in one water and the other water temperatures of chemicals and all this complicated stuff which nowadays you don't really have to deal with that there are these uh, film labs popping up everywhere and it's kind of a hipster thing if you walk into these places the decor and everything is super hipster and um, you just drop off your film and for a reasonable price, you know, the range is between 12 and $20, depending on the type of film, but they'll give you a uh, different resolution of scans. You pay, you know, the, you pay more for higher resolution scans, but I usually go for the highest resolution JPEG. And uh, it's good enough for me, you know, they, they offer TIFFs a lot of these places, but um, it kind of takes all the difficult part um, on the back end of, of shooting on film out of the picture, which a lot of people who are really into this stuff you can you can develop your own film you can buy the chemicals and you know with a thermometer make sure everything is the right temperature and do this all at home i think people tend to do this more with black and white because it's a little bit easier but um you can develop your own film if you want and then uh film lab scams as I, scans as i mentioned um they'll scan it for you and you can go pick up your negatives later um you can also just have them develop it and you can because sometimes the scanning is, is expensive at some places you can buy a, a film mount like a holder for the film and then use a digital camera, hopefully a high megapixel camera and you can digitally convert your negatives, uh, which you can actually do if you have negatives from, you know, from the past and you wanna do that. So that's also an option. Uh, I've done a little bit of that also. And lastly, I think this is lastly. Yeah, oh no, I, we have a couple more. So then we get into experimental. So there's this practice called lomography, which is introducing the element of randomness into your film photos where you use either expired film or just film that hasn't been treated well, like exposed to high temperatures or whatever, just introduce like random elements and you're almost creating abstract photography. Uh, there's also the double exposures that people do where you, um, you, it's hard to explain, but you basically double exposures like you do digitally, but you do it with film. Um, you, expired film, aerial, as recently I, I started mounting a point and shoot camera to a drone and taking photos uh it's pretty interesting with film from the sky and then part of my technique which is my digital approach to film is using a black promist filter this is a special filter that's usually used for video um, and it adds a softness on the roll off of the highlights um, it has like some kind of uh, material inside the glass and it basically adds a haze um, and people use this to imitate film or uh, vintage lenses but actually, if you add this filter to your film photography, you make it extra filmy, so to speak. And um, it really has a cool effect, especially with the night photography and, and has like this cyberpunk aesthetic that I really like. So um, yeah, and then the pushing and pulling that I mentioned earlier. So editing, so traditional purists would probably look down on editing film because the whole point is, you know, you shoot a type of film, so it looks like that type of film, so I get it. But my approach is partially using those filters that I mentioned and then bringing these scans, digital scans of the film into Lightroom and Photoshop and just doing what you would do to a digital photo. So you can do all the basic, you know, global adjustments, but you can't really take things too far because they're not raw images. They're not digital images. So I wouldn't just white balance because certain film is rated for white balance. Um, like there's tungsten rated film and there's daylight rated film. So that kind of defies the purpose. I, I, I don't know that you, you make your own rules, I guess, for this thing, but I wouldn't change the white balance. I would adjust the exposure. You may maybe bring down the highlights, depending if it wasn't exposed correctly, you know, lift the shadows. You can add contrast. You can lift the blacks and take away contrast. Um, you can use the color calibration in, in Lightroom, but I wouldn't change colors too much because the whole point, as I mentioned, of shooting with a certain type of film is it looks like that type of film. Dodging and burning is pretty cool, you know, because, you know, you can add the contrast that way. Um, Orton blur is uh, sort of that haze effect added to highlights. So I, actually my photos, people 
some people, you know, like them. And some people say I go a little too far with adding this hazy filter and then adding urban blur on top of that to make them really kind of dreamy looking. But that's just kind of my style. You can add a vignette, you know, um, just like you would digitally because certain lenses have more vignette than others. But you can also add it digitally. And I think I think that's it. OK, so that's it for the presentation. I'm just going to go over some examples. Is that is that should I do that, Linda? Like, yeah, or should absolutely. I take questions first? Okay, so no, let's go into some examples. Yeah, I don't see any questions, but for those that have them, this is a good time to put them in the chat. So okay. yeah, let's see some, let's see some photos. Yeah, enough talking. Let's see some film. All right, so like I said, I'm a big fan of night street photography. So this is a series. This is a one roll, uh, Portra 800, one of the popular film stocks that I took um, to Las Vegas. And so obviously there's a lot of lights and neons and stuff in Las Vegas. So with that haze and the Orton blur and everything, it was just a really awesome combination of elements. So here we have some of the stuff um, on downtown Las Vegas, you know, the classic, because when I take film photos, that's another thing, part of my approach is I don't want to date the photos. I don't want to take a photo where there's a modern looking car or something that you can tell, oh, this was taken in early 2000s or whatever. You want it to look like sort of timeless, you know, you don't want movie posters and stuff like that. So old Las Vegas, downtown Las Vegas was really photogenic in that sense. You know, these kind of photos, like obviously if you look at these posters and you could tell it's probably more modern, but you know, this is, you can see this haze around the highlights here and that's partially from the Orton blur and partially from that filter that I mentioned. And it really works well with neons and a lot of these colors are just the portrait 800 is a very, um, just true to what the scene looks like. Um, I'm going to show you another role called Cinestill 800, which is another one of my favorite night photography stocks. But you can see this is one of my favorite ones from the series here. Um, it just has like a vintage look and look. And then my street photography, I guess, composition in general, like I mentioned, is um, just empty streets. You know, if there's a person, there's only one, which I don't think I got any people in these. But uh, you know, these photos look like they'd be, they could have been taken in Las Vegas at any point in the, uh, I guess, 80s, 70s. Um, let's go to some Cinestill. So I had a little project I was working on, sort of a cyberpunk aesthetic. I didn't really, I was going to make a video. I didn't really go through with that. But I did take a bunch of photos in Chinatown in San Francisco. Because it's, uh, cyberpunk is sort of a Blade Runner type um, aesthetic. So let me find some Cinestill. This is the Cinestill. And then also describe what makes Cinestill so special. You can tell by the highlights. I probably didn't label this correctly. No, this looks like Portrait 800. Um, cool, black and white. Uh... All right, we'll yeah. just go to another example then that I know is yeah. Cinestill. Yeah, Karen just said she really likes the neon. Yeah, I'm a big neon. When it comes to street photography, I'm a big neon fan. Um, it, it really looks like it helps with that kind of dated aesthetic. Okay, um, this this will have to do because I can't find my Cinestill Chinatown stuff. But um, let me open this. Okay, so... That's a good example, but I don't like that photo. Let's, let's find a good example of the, it's, it's called halation. So, okay, this this kind of shows it. So Cinestill is a, a stock taken from, I forgot what type of film, but it was a film used for movies and it's been rehoused as a uh, photography film. And so what happens with Cinestill is it's Cinestill 800T, the T means tungsten. So it's tungsten white balance. So depending on the lights that are on your scene, they will look bluish. There's a lot of bluish tones, uh, as you can see here. And then the main thing in Cinestill is this halation, I believe it's called, around all the bright lights. And it just has that 80s kind of cyberpunk aesthetic that I was talking about. Um, There's another cool scene, you know, empty uh, train subway. It's not a subway, but it's a metro rail. You know, you got the halation and then it, it's got that hazy look to it, you know, from the filter and from the Orton blur and, um, you know, empty scenes like this really work well for street photography. Okay, let me find another example and then I'll go into a little black and white. 
This is more San Francisco here. Um, here you can actually see the halation very well because we went to an, um, it wasn't abandoned, but it was an oil oil refinery that you can shoot, I guess, legally from, from the gate. There was security that came and asked us what we were doing, but um, it also looks very industrial. It's part of like that cyberpunk aesthetic that I was talking about. And you can see the halation on these lights like crazy. And that just has like that Blade Runner cyberpunk aesthetic that I was talking about. Um, I'm gonna show you some black and white real quick. So shooting with black and white on film is kind of like shooting with um, shooting black and white, you know, on uh, digitally. What works are contrasty scenes, and um, it's no different with film. So if you go out in nature and you look for scenes where there's shadows and all these textures, these create these are mangroves here in Florida. All these textures look really awesome on black and white film. That's a gator right there. Um, so this is obviously not street photography, but uh, it's not landscape photography in the traditional sense, I would say. It's sort of the way I approach it with film. And just high contrast scenes, just like in digitally, they look good in, um, in black and white. Okay, this is the other one, I was, other photos I, were, I was talking about. Um, we see a little bit more of the nature stuff here too. Um, this stuff I actually shot with a vintage Nikon F camera. It was actually the same model of camera taken to Vietnam. They took two, they took a Leica M or something. And then the other popular one is the Nikon F, the first Nikon SLR, I guess, line. And um, so that's actually why I shot these photos sort of like Vietnam-esque kind of. But I also took film and shot aerial photography from a plane. And in the black and white, you know, it looks pretty cool. I'll show you some color ones, but it, it, it just looks, you know, like you can see this graininess here. The grain, obviously you can add it later, but there's something about it naturally occurring in the film that looks pretty cool. Let me find the, uh, and there's something about the colors. Like, I mean, it depends on your age, age range and, and how you grew up, but it's something about it looks, just reminds me of the nineties, the eighties, you know, just, you know, the, even though these are modern buildings and stuff, this is a uh, shot on Portra 800. So I shot with a high ISO film because, you know, actually aerial photography is kind of difficult because the plane's shaking around and you're trying to focus and you're trying to do all this stuff. And so the last thing you need to worry about is motion blur added by to having too slow of a shutter speed. So I shot with the 800, which I would not normally use during the day, but because it was moving around so much on the plane. So yeah, you can see some of these, the blues and the greens, you know, it just looks, it looks vintagey. That's the word of the day, vintagey. Um, Let me slide this question in because I think it's okay. it's interesting. Susan's curious. Um, when you first started using film, did it open a creative approach that surprised you? She says it seems like film forces the eye or mind or approach to a different level, um, and yeah. then certain patience is required. So yeah. Sure so actually, that's part of that. the challenge, right? So. What's ironic when, when shooting on film, um, I guess I don't really count the photos that I shoot digitally, but when I shoot digitally, I, you know, I get my composition, shoot a bunch, shoot a bunch, change the focus, shoot a bunch, you know, like, and you just, you shoot, you overshoot so that you don't have to deal with it later. Like, oh, I missed the focus on this shot or whatever. But something about film, like you only get 36, 24 shots, whatever the role has, but you end up with more keepers. You know, it's just, it's cause you're like, you take your time you think about the scene, you know, with street photography, obviously things are constantly moving. So you might miss a moment, but you, you just kind of sit there and you're like, do I want to waste one of my 36 shots on this scene right here? And there's something about the discipline of it. And it, it just slows everything down. It's it just, uh, so that's, that's why I, I'm not a big fan of the point shoots because it's, you know, takes too much of that out of the process, but it, yeah, the, the process of shooting film that the difficulty of it is part of it part of the experience. It's not just like lifting your phone, click and get in the photo. You have to wait, you have to focus, you know, like, and then you don't, at the end, you don't, like I said, you don't really know if you got the shot until you get your film developed. So, you know, it's also that, that delayed gratification there. So yeah, there's definitely an enjoyment in the process. You know, if you want to slow things down in your photography. So I really want to find, okay, well, actually, this is a good example of um, that super high ISO film that I mentioned, the 3200. It's called uh, Kodak T-Max, and you can see it's, it's grainy like crazy here. Um, so actually, let me mention another thing. With shooting in black and white, some people more on the purist side, they say you shouldn't change the tones in black and white. It's supposed to be black and white. 
But then I did some research and I found out that when you, when people did dark room, you know, developing and stuff, you, you would use a toned paper. That's how you get those, those bluish black and white, you know, toned image, sepia tone, sepia tones, sepia or sepia. I don't know. But, um, so people would tone their images, right? So, so it isn't completely wrong to go in here, uh, go into your color grading and make your highlights a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, so yeah, you can see this with this one, I went sort of like a turquoise-ish kind of teal thing in the shadows and sort of reddish, you know, you want to, you know, it's color theory. So you want to use things on the opposite ends of the, the color wheel, but you can definitely see the grain here. And this is because it's 3200 ISO and it just looks really cool. You know, we got Bruce Lee over here. Um, this is from wandering around Chinatown at night. Uh, this is, I want to show you another favorite film of mine here. Ilford HP5 Plus. Um, let me look for the South Beach stuff. So like I like I mentioned, you know, I like to shoot scenes where you, you can't really date the photos. So in South Beach, there's a lot of Art Deco architecture. This is not it. Um, this Let's say this, for example. So there's all this Art Deco stuff, which I guess the Art Deco style is from the 20s, the 30s. And so if you take photos that are, you know, not showing any modern cars or whatever, these look like, you know, newspaper clippings obviously not in the newspaper but you know photos that were taken in that era you know there's a lot of old theaters and stuff around uh, modern cranes but um any more south beach here i'm sure there's more but you get the idea you know using film and taking shots of you know retro scenes or old scenes I, I, one of my actual goals is to go on to uh root is it route 66 right and right. um just shoot a bunch of film there because you have all the antique relics and the you know the broken down buildings and all that stuff because it just when you shoot on an old you know format like film you want to shoot old things um and then this is just some regular street photography during the day you know nice lines and contrast and stuff but uh this film what i like about it um it's pretty contrasty i guess you know there's also the factor of where you get your film developed it might be end up more contrasty at some film labs than others because they do this is one thing i don't really like they do have some liberties with the with the editing like when they're scanning it which i haven't fully figured out w to what degree but i have noticed that some labs you know things look more contrasty than others uh regardless i do add contrast but i do like to dodge and burn and control where the contrast is in the in the film but um hp5 is uh one of my favorite black and white films um let's see let me show you some other good starter films so kodak well, gold looking... sorry i was gonna say while you're looking for something i was gonna ask you a question that oh yeah no rose problem has for you. rose is curious do you get some of these types of architectural shots sold to the land or the business owners for their use um i haven't to... pursued that uh it's a good idea I'm just kind of lazy when it comes to monetizing my photography as far as prints and stuff. Cause it's, um, I don't know. I'm such like a purist that I'm like, Oh, I'm doing it for the, for the art, bro. You know? So it's, well, it's you need it that, for the gas money now. Yeah, I know. No, it's maybe it's cause I'm lazy and, and I'm, you know, I have sort of like freelance jobs that once I hit the road in the van, I'm going to be hungry and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to want to sell it more. So yeah, maybe I need, I need to get a little hungrier, but yeah, I definitely should. Um, so this is a film stock called Kodak Gold. And this is kind of like, you know, like I said, your depends when you grew up and what era, but like, I remember like a lot of the photos that my parents would take would, would be like this. What makes it gold, I guess, is it shows up sort of in the shadows. Um, it's sort of, it's hard to tell, but you'd have to see it side by side with like something like Ultramax but it is a little bit warmer, right? So that's the, the gold in the Kodak. And it's a good starter film because it's uh, relatively cheap. I think there's $12, $11 a roll um, or, or cheaper if you buy them in, in slightly bulk. But um, yeah, this is a good starter film. So like, yeah, when you, when you get started in film photography, once you acquire your camera, which actually I should mention some good starter cameras, um, you want to use like cheap film stocks and, and kind of mess up a few times before you, you buy the expensive stuff like the Portras and the Ektars and which I haven't even shot on Ektar. Um, and there's, I don't know, there's some really expensive film out there, but um, you can get pretty good results with cheap stuff. Like like this is Atlantis in the Bahamas and it's, you know, Kodak Gold, cheap, cheap stuff. Um, maybe I should switch to my camera real quick and then just show my 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 film cameras, right? Some some examples. You know, people ask me what, what should I use to get started? Um, 
this is i think it was the first film camera that i bought it's a canon everything's gonna be reversed i guess because of the no it canon looks good here. oh really nope, it looks I, reverse it, it's screen. just reverse for you yeah it's re it's perfect oh, for us. i'm in backwards world so this is a <laughs> canon a1 so people recommend the ae one the program one but nobody talks about the Canon A1 because the AE1 has aperture priority built in, which I actually always shoot on aperture priority and just make sure my shutter speed is somewhere where it's not going to lead to motion blur because I don't want to deal with, you know, like metering and changing every single setting. So aperture priority is what I primarily shoot on. But uh, I think the program one has shutter speed priority and AE1, I, or I'm getting it reversed, but those two cameras have either aperture priority or shutter priority. This one has both. And nobody talks about the A1. I don't know why, but um, maybe it doesn't look as cool because it's not gray. You know, that's like the vintage kind of look, but it's a great camera to get started. It also has the built-in meter and has a digital display. And actually, uh, well, it's good for night photography for one. And actually it goes to a high, most cameras, they can only go to like one second shutter unless you go into bulb mode. But this one I can go into like, I've seen it go up to like seven seconds shutter, which I, I haven't shot any of that. That's super long exposure. There's uh, something else in film that I forgot what it's called, but if you go too high of a exposure, it um, the film becomes less sensitive. I forgot exactly how it works, but you don't want to go too high with your exposure times. But the, the, yeah, the Canon A1 and then the lenses are really cheap. You know, lenses are cheap with film cameras overall, but that's a great one to get started. I also have a Pentax. Um, this is the Spotomatic, Spotmatic F. And it has the traditional meter in it, which is the little stick that goes up and down that I told you about. Um, I bought this because there's this lens that I like a lot called the Helios 44 or the 42. Okay. It's a, a Russian lens that a lot of people buy an adapter and use it on digital cameras for that swirly right. bokeh. And so I, it's an M42 mount, I believe. And so I wanted a film camera that could take that lens. Um, so this is uh, M42 mount. Is that the right? M42? Am I getting it right? Mount? That, I don't know. I can't help you there. Okay. But well, I believe... the question, where, where can people find cameras? Okay. So I, uh, I should have mentioned this also. Well, I mentioned the, the you know, finding them in garage sales and, and Goodwill. But um, apart from that, like I said, eBay, you know, like just make sure you don't overpay for something that a YouTuber hyped up. Like, um, let me see. Here. So for my, my experiment with putting the camera on the drone is actually not fully my idea. I saw somebody do it on YouTube and I had to do it myself, but this Olympus stylus, let's see if it gets the focus, yeah. It's a little point shoot. I guess it's cool because it's pretty small and, and I guess it, the autofocus is really accurate maybe, but they're going for like $200, $250, which you should never pay that much for a point and shoot camera. I only bought it because the mount let me show you the drone real quick, actually. The mounts so that this, the- You're sorry? attaching, are you saying you're attaching these to a drone? Yeah, so this drone right here. <laughs> so oh it, it's goodness. it's a DIY kind of drone. You know, I mean, I bought it built actually, but 3D printed bracket with a little servo that clicks the shutter. So you you can trigger it with your remote. So you go up, you, you compose, which your compo composition is gonna be exactly the same because the, the camera on the drone is wide. And then obviously you're shooting with a 35, I think it's a 35 millimeter lens on this, on the stylus. And so you go up, take your photo. Um, and so you can't fit obviously a larger camera on here. And then the point shoots automatically forward the film, which is why you use them on the drones. But um, yeah, that that's why I have the point shoot. I definitely don't use the point shoot for real photography because I don't like them. Um, then I also have the Nikon F that I mentioned. This one I actually got for free. Uh, a friend of mine was just getting rid of stuff. And I guess he was, he took a photography course or he was into it for a while. But um, this is the one that I mentioned that the uh, they brought to Vietnam. So it's pretty cool, like as a historical artifact. I don't know if this one specifically was taken to Vietnam. Um, sometimes you'll find cameras with like people's names sketched or stenciled, stenciled. I don't know what they use like a device to kind of like stencil in their name and stuff. And so you'll find like pieces of history. So there's, and that's actually part of shooting with film. Like you're shooting with something that's been passed down and passed down, you know, people find them in their attic, you know, their grandparents' camera, you know, like that's a popular way actually of getting them like, oh, my grandfather left, you know, some attic and you find like a, a Leica with the full lenses and all this stuff. So people get really wow. lucky. You hear all these stories. 
Um, so there's a lot of ways to get the cameras, you know, Goodwill. Um, Goodwill is probably the best, actually, if you don't want to go actively to a bunch of garage sales, because you never know what you're going to find at the garage sale. But Goodwill, the one close to me used to have a specific section with all these vintage, a lot of them were like kind of digital, old digital cameras, which nobody wants, but you would find some stuff there every now and then. Um, do we have any more questions here? I'm looking at the... Yeah, there's one question here. Um, Carolyn, um, and I, 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 we were talking about it um, earlier this week. Oh, does film expire? Her grandkids, no, uh, her grandkids recently found a box of four rolls of film, and she's curious, do, does film expire when it's not kept in the refrigerator? Is that a, um, is that so a thing? From what I hear, well, so like going back to the Lomography thing, people will actually some of the expired film, if you go on, on eBay, is more expensive than non-expired film because people like to shoot an expired for that lomography thing and, you know, come out with something cool that was not intended. So that's kind of weird, you know, that if expired film is going for more than regular. But um, from what I hear, if, you're, if you buy film and you use it, because the newer films are being, I guess, manufactured and processed, you know, mm -hmm. daily or whatever. But um, if you... From, if you use it within six months of the day of purchase, you can keep them somewhere, obviously not in direct sunlight or somewhere super hot, but like on a shelf somewhere, which most of my stuff I use within six months. So I have it all on a shelf. If you if you buy expired film or if you're going to be storing film for a long term, you, you definitely have to refrigerate it. Um, there's special boxes you can put them in, but it really has to be just like in a refrigerated environment. Um, Actually, let me, since so we have the camera here, I'm going to show you just what the boxes look like of my favorite films, just so you know what to look for um, if you want to get into some stuff. So a great starter film and, and great daylight film is, is Kodak Ultramax 400. So yeah, Kodak Ultramax 400, it's, it's ISO 400 speed film, and it just, it looks really cool, just like in the middle of the day. Like I would never shoot, you know, regular digital photos in the middle of the day because, you know, nobody, you want golden hour, right? But just like in the middle of the day, this this stuff looks great. Just the way it renders the the greens and the blues and something about it, you know, looks really cool. This is my favorite uh, night film, or I don't know, it's between this and Portrait 800. I think we lost focus again, but this is the Cinestill 800 tungsten uh, color temp white balance, and it's the one with the little halations on the lights. Pretty cool okay. stuff. So, so where do you get your film developed? Um, so I have one lab. There's a bunch of labs here in Miami, and there's actually labs in every city. If you look around, you'll you'll see them popping up. It's another little trendy business, yeah. mm -hmm. but you can also send them in online. There's there, and it's actually cheaper in some ways. You just have to obviously ship it, develop. You know, it's like a three week. You know, I'm I don't know. I'm exactly. spoiled actually by the film lab I go to, where they'll do sometimes same day develop and scan, which is like it's pretty insane for film. Um, but uh, and they're the cheapest for the color. They they get it done for twelve bucks. Same day scan sometimes if you do it early enough in the day. Um, shout out to Cardinal Labs, Miami. Um, <laughs> so they, they do great. And then the problem is there are types of film that need to be developed with certain chemicals. So anything color, I believe, uses a C41. I think it says somewhere over here. Yeah, C41, it's the name of the chemical or something. I know the film people are going to be bashing me, but it's, it's the chemical they used. And so my favorite black and white film, this Ilford, HP5 cannot be developed in the same lab where they use the C41. So for this stuff, I go to another lab um, for the black and white. And it's a little bit more expensive, but I there was a lab before this one that I was going to for the black and white. And it was it was costing me almost $30 per roll. And I was like, I'm not paying $30 plus the from the price of the film. That's just yeah. too much. So they get it done, I believe, for 17, 18 bucks for the black and white. Um, did I go over? Oh, this is the TMAC. This is the 3200 ISO film, that crazy grainy stuff. Um, I think that's, oh, Portrait 800. How can I forget? Can't forget about Portrait 800. Everybody likes the 400 because, you know, that's the hipster thing for shooting portraits and, and you know, all the Instagram stuff. But for the night, night stuff where you don't want, you know, crazy colors because the still, like I said, it'll make things look kind of blue, which is mm -hmm. cool. For some things but if you want to just like true to true to nature true to what it looks like portrait 800 is good for that um and then there's like all these crazy films out there where like they're like almost designer films um like i think they're rehousing some old types of films and, and it just like there's like a purple film where everything green 
everything that's green turns purple. I forgot what it was called, but it's just like, there's just weird hipster. That's like Lomography type stuff. So there's, um, there's a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff to learn. So my first camera was a Pentax Pentax. Yeah. Pentax is, I think Pentax and Minolta are like, you know, some of the more popular ones. Um, I believe Nikon, this, what's special about this Nikon F is cause it was the first, one of the first SLRs or one of the first consumer level SLRs or something, uh, or everything else before that was range finders or something. I don't, I don't really know too much, mm -hmm. you know, but, yeah. um, cause I'm a modern film guy, <laughs> but, um, I just really love this Canon, you know, like this, I just look at this camera and I'm like, wow, you're awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it, there's something about them like because you know like i said they, they have history you know like it's it's not like you know when you have a digital camera you're like oh this is cool i'm gonna sell it in two years you know like this is something that you know if you're into it if you, i guess if you don't get bored because you're not going to sell it for money maybe if film gets even more popular but um it's just something about them that they're just like wow this has been around for 50 years 30 years whatever it is you know so it's just a different, it's just another art form, you know, it's still photography, but there's so many different techniques. And like you said, so many different films, who would have thought that? Yeah. So, and then the pushing and pulling and like, yeah, there's a lot of, the there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room there to be creative. You just have to find the time and, and patience to, to, to kind of sit down and work with it. Well, like, like I said, once you get like spoiled or bored of digital, which I don't not shoot digital, but you want to like slow things down, try out film. You know, it's, 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 uh, something about it. It just, it's like the anti-digital, you know, but then right. edit but there's them. something about I mean, nine frames a second. Fifteen. Yeah, I know. I can't, don't take that away from me. I just got it. So don't take well, it away. From me. It's what's crazy is people used to shoot all these things on film before. Like, like, uh, like Ben is talking a, about the underwater photography. Like I just, I done that just blew my mind. I'm still not over the underwater film photography. Cause like, I shoot underwater photography and I couldn't imagine doing it on film, but you know, yeah, people used say, to shoot things on, on film all yeah. the time. That was it. <laughs> Go look at Ben when you get a chance. Cause I know you shoot underwater. I know he does too. He's at on Instagram. He's I'm going to get in trouble. Fins, feathers, photos, something like that. Ben Cowan, but yeah. look for him because some of those pictures, I'm like, these are, these are, these are old pictures and they're beautiful. They still hold yeah. up. Subjects are still there. So it was funny because I had, um, uh, posted about your uh, presentation on Facebook. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, but I will occasionally post there. And my high school friends were coming back and, and, you know, telling stories about me because that's, I was a film shooter back in high school. I was the um, editor of our yearbook. I was, you know, I always had a camera in my hand and we were kind of laughing and kind of, you know, um, telling stories on each other that, you know, we spent a lot of time in the dark room, getting out of other classes to spend time in the dark room. And yeah. uh, it, well, so that's that's one of those things where I think the people that are into film now, they're into film now because they weren't they didn't ex they weren't traumatized by it in the past. Right. Like anybody who shot film in the past is like never again, you know, like now my digital camera, I can just everything is there, you know, unlimited photos like. So maybe that's, maybe that's why it's like a hipster thing. It's like, you know, you you kind of like want to be the anti modern whatever, you know. Well, you might be a hipster, Chris. You just might be. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't have hipster Argyle sweaters and stuff. But... Let me just check. So and see there's a question. A... Uh, what do you get back from the lab? So, so you they send the scans right away, or if you go to a good lab, they'll send them. You know, first day, second day. Um, but then you have to go back and pick up the negatives, which some people they they actually have a when you fill out the form, they have an option of like, do you want your negatives? Which I can't imagine not keeping your negatives because I don't know, like. That's the whole point, you know, to have a physical yeah. representation. But I guess some people just like, maybe if you're your point and shoot shooter, you're just like, blah, 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 you know, take your digitals and screw my negatives. But I always, I always go back and get the negatives and you keep them in your, in your binder, I guess, like what they used to do back in the day, right? I have a binder. Hey, that is my day you're talking about. And yes, <laughs> you have binders. So, and little uh, sleeves. With the for... horse and carriages and the binders and all that. Oh, yeah. now that was just me. You did not need to do that. <laughs> all right. What else do you have for us? Um, you want to wrap up? You got uh, how much time? To... Uh, you know, we're close. We're I close. could do a quick little uh walkthrough of, of my editing, yeah. of a, just sure. you know, to show like the the minimal editing that I do. Okay. So let me go back to share screen. That big green button. 
Okay, so I'm gonna have to like just reset one of these edits, I guess. This Las Vegas stuff is probably the easiest to find a good example here. Actually, I'll do one night and one day because the edits are pretty quick. So I'm gonna reset this. So this is what I got from the film, film lab, right? It looks like, you know, a night photo, a little bit underexposed in the shadows. The, the color temperature of these lights, this, you know, if this was, it must be, this is not Cinestill, but it looks like it because it's blue here, but I don't know. It just, cause whatever color temperature these lights are, it just looks like that. So what I would do, you know, obviously there is no lens profile here. So you don't do that step. And there's no like, you know, the profile up here where you switch to Adobe landscape. So, you know, you don't want to put, push the exposure too much, but I can brighten it, bring down the highlights. This is just a JPEG by the way. So you, you basically treat it like a JPEG as it was digitally, but I think you have more uh, latitude with digital um, JPEGs. But anyways, you know, I bring the shadows up a little bit. And then part of my, you know, haze thing that I do, it's a little bit of negative clarity at the beginning. Then I do the Orton Blur in Photoshop. And when I bring it back in, I do a little bit more afterwards. Cause you know, you don't want to only just do this cause it affects the whole scene. When I'm in Photoshop, I usually paint the Orton Blur just on the light, direct light sources, very bright areas. But so I would do a little bit of that. And like I said, you don't touch the white balance as tempting as it might be to be like, oh, I want this, you know, to look more accurate. No, like the film is supposed to look like what it is supposed to look like as far as the color temp. But the, that's just my rule. Maybe <laughs> you don't have to follow that rule. And then I, I mess with the, um, the calibration a little bit. So this is pretty cool when you're doing it with digital photos too. There's a lot of, there's a lot you can do here. A lot of people skip the calibration tab, but um, I will only mess with this a little bit, right? So I won't move these sliders. I'll decide what I want to change, you know, make the reds more magenta. Um, I usually do the first two, I believe. I don't really touch this one because this actually would bring it more to accurate color temp, right? Which we don't want to do. So I'll usually make, especially if it's Cinestill, make things a little bit bluer rather than green, because this green is kind of like pukey, pukey kind of green. So I'll make it a little bit more aqua, I guess that would be. Yeah. And then I will make the reds a little bit more magenta, but just a tiny bit. And then obviously, like I said, I'll take this into Photoshop. And then um, I also do, you know, crop, uh, I mean, uh, content aware fill, the cropping, you know, like another part of, you know, taking photos on film, you you take a lot of care when you're composing, get your verticals right. And, you know, but you can always do a little bit of adjustment. Um, different labs will give you different resolutions. This one is, uh, that's actually why I like this lab also, because they give you a huge resolution for 12 bucks. Some of the labs the, for this same resolution, they'll charge you like 25 or 30. So they, they, they're pretty uh, generous there. And then I don't really mess with HSL or anything. And then actually when I do the Photoshop edits, I'll come back and then I'll, I'll add the contrast here and I'll, make it a little bit more filmy by lifting the blacks. Um, obviously not, that's too much contrast, but um, I don't know if it's cheating to make it look more filmy, but you know, the whole point is to just do whatever, <laughs> whatever you feel do, creatively. Yeah. yeah. So that's an example sort of, you know, without the Photoshop step, because that would take too long, but you can see like, you know, a little underexposed, the colors are kind of like dull and then you oh. make it pop a little bit more. Right. Not nothing too crazy. You don't want to, you know, it's not a digital image. You don't want to get carried away, but that's Can you put those side by side. Sorry. Oh yeah. Um, well I do the, the backslash here. So that's original. And I mean, I could make a duplicate copy, I guess. Um, no, it's fine. You're good. Copy. You're good. Yeah. I don't want to mess with my layout here too much. Okay. Let's, let's do a, um, some uh, ultra max. No, this is color plus, uh, what is Ultramax? I think the Baja Mar is, where is it? This one. All right, this is some Ultramax 400. Um, <clears throat> something, daylight. All right, so this is like middle of the day. You know, like this as a, as a digital photo would look probably terrible or boring, you know, like it, it, you know, nobody shoots the middle of the day. I mean, obviously you can, but I don't, um, but you know, some, something about how it looks in film is different. So let's see what it looked like from the lab. I actually didn't do too much actually. You know, if you think about it, 
I just lifted the shadows and adjust the, um, the horizon. But uh, let's just go through it real quick. You know, it's pretty evenly exposed. Like I said, you don't want to shoot any high dynamic range scenes. My personal process usually involves lifting the shadows, um, dodging and burning, and then adding the contrast in again later so I can control sort of the dark areas. That's just my personal process. So obviously I'm gonna lift the shadows now, but it won't look, it wouldn't look like that in the final image. Um, I don't do as much of the Orton blur hazy stuff during the day because the light source is sort of everywhere. You know, it's not like at night street photography where you have like the individual light sources. So I would probably just do a little bit and I don't even, I don't even know if I would Orton blur this. And then with the calibration over here, it's easy to get carried away, right? Because, you know, it starts from green being sort of yellowish green to this teal kind of ugly thing. So I sort of don't like it being too yellow. So I would, you know, do something like that. I think is I do the same adjustment for the, uh, for the night photos, but it really varies scene to scene. Something like that. And then of course I don't touch this because that completely changes it. And then, like I said, Photoshop and all that, but you know, add the contrast back in. And I'm a big fan of lifting the blacks there. And then actually what I forgot to do in the last one was the vignetting, which I usually do with the radial filter, but just to do it quickly here, you know, the vignetting. Uh, it's probably too much, but um, it's definitely gonna be more contrasty than the other one that I did. Let me bring that back. But um, I don't know, it's almost the same actually. So that's, let's do a before and after. Yeah, so it, it, there's not a lot of editing you do, I guess with the day stuff, but it really varies scene to scene. I think there's like a golden hour shot somewhere here, but I don't know if I edited it actually. Yeah, so I guess never mind. Um, okay. I don't know, there's a couple examples there. No, that's cool. You know, it's really, for me, it's kind of a, you took me back quite a few years, I'm embarrassed to admit, but um, it's also for for people that are going to, that are kind of interested in it, and they're probably scrolling through YouTube looking for more information. This mm -hmm. is pretty comprehensive, Chris. So that's, it's, that's what we do these for, is just to help yeah. those people find stuff, find people that are doing what they're doing, and um, I certainly appreciate the time you took to do this for us. Yeah, no closing words. Closing yeah. words. Yeah. Um, Tips. Besides go, go and shoot <laughs> film. Go um, to Goodwill. <laughs> yeah, go to Goodwill. No, I mean, this, this one is still, I guess, since I mentioned that people don't talk about it too much, you can probably, I got this one for like 110, 120, the Canon A1, my favorite one over here. Um, another thing, like, actually, if I want to mention how I, kind of got started in film was uh, just buying vintage lenses and using them in photography and in video because that, that was that's sort of the um, the gateway mm -hmm. drug. And then you're like, well, what what would the actual film look like? And then you kind of go down that path. So, you know, if you want to sort of get started, maybe just buy some vintage lenses with a mount for your camera and just see how the vintage lenses and, and, and buy them like like not too dirty or beat up, but buy them a little bit weathered because that's part of the look, you know, like I don't go through and clean all these lenses. Uh, they're pretty clean as is, I guess. But um, there's something about vintage lenses. Like I mentioned that Helios 44, the, the swirly bokeh, like they do offer a different look. And so maybe that'll get you hooked enough that you want to try, go all the way and try film. So there you go. Well, and to be honest, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it would be really expensive to jump in. And if you hated it, you, you haven't lost that much money, especially the mm -hmm. prices of these used cameras. So I think it might be film that might get you in trouble or um, processing that film, but um, you know, it's, it's something completely different. And it's another, it's another yeah. reason to slow down and let those creative, you know, juices flow through you. So, all right, Chris, with that, I wanna shut down your session. Um, all right. Thank you. 
honestly, thank you for coming back. And no um, I want you to let me know when you get on the road and you've got your landscape um, class. Your, I, oh, I can I play doing... the, the promo here, actually? Yeah, can I play a video? sure. So this is, tell us what this promo is for, your upcoming trip? Uh, upcoming... It's for the photography course. Um, oh, the course, sorry, yeah. Landscape photography, um, it covers anything from switching your camera to manual mode and then to beginning composition, editing, uh, dealing with okay. certain elements. Because, uh, well, let me pr pr play the promo, but um, I've done a lot of traveling and, and shot in in the snow and the winter and the tropics and underwater and overwater. And so, I don't know, I've, I've been a few places and, and done landscape photography in a lot of places. So um, I kind of just want to share what I've learned yeah. and yeah. fund Do my adventure. <laughs> to most photographers starting out, camera settings can be a whole other language. Add to that different brands, technical specs, types of lenses and filters, and you can lose yourself very easily. Then you finally get your images onto your computer, start poking around Lightroom, moving sliders here and there, and they still look nothing like what you see on Instagram. Don't worry, I got you covered. My name is Chris Crass, and as an award-winning filmmaker and photographer, I've been traveling the world for the last seven years visiting the most breathtaking locations and honing my landscape photography skills. From harsh winter conditions to capture the elusive northern lights, into sweltering tropical rainforests and volcanic beaches, and deep below the surface of the ocean seeking exotic sea life, my thirst for adventure has given me experiences taking camera gear into many challenging environments. In this course, I distill all my technical knowledge in how to create amazing compositions while working with the unpredictable beauty of nature. My masterclass covers the exact gear you need to get started, settings for nailing your shots on location, and editing techniques for making bangers in Lightroom and Photoshop. Sign up today to receive three free mini tutorials that cover essential camera settings and quick tips to make your photos pop in post. There's a world of beauty out there, so don't miss out on the adventure of landscape photography. All right, with that, I, it, it looks promising and I, I truly wish you the best as you start your new adventures um, <laughs> on the road. And all, you know, guys, he's fun to watch on Instagram. So um, consider following him there. Uh, Boss Talk Productions can be found at bosstalkpro.com. And while you're there, check out Chris's travel guides. He's got a lot of free photography tutorials on his website and look at his many documentaries and his film portfolio. If you're on Instagram, be sure to give them a follow at Boss Talk Pro. Next week, videographer and photographer Andrew Vaughn will be here to present the power of video for social media. So until next week, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. Mm -hmm.